Hello everybody, this is Dr. Porter Utley, and I am sorry that I didn't make it to class today at 10 o'clock, but unfortunately I had a very, very sick pet who I had to sort of rush to the vet this morning, and uh, the pet is resting, and so I am now able to do some online lectures for you guys to make up for the fact that I wasn't there today, and I do apologize for that. There are going to be four of these screencasts. Each of them are 10 minutes long. The pace you will find will be a little bit quicker than normal, but that's because I want to get the material delivered to you, and if you miss something, you can just rewind and go back and rewatch it. First of all, a couple of really quick reminders. We have assignment three, that's chapter six of Plotkin. Um, that's, or I should say, the discussion questions for chapter six in Plotkin are due on Thursday, and we'll discuss that in class. And then next week, assignment four, which focuses on uh, chapter seven of Plotkin, is due, and you don't have anything due on Tuesday. Okay. Remember last Tuesday we started talking about the fundamental chemi chemicals of life, okay? And if you remember, the fundamental chemicals are life, of life are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And on Tuesday, I actually started to discuss these other really, really important plant compounds that um, exist, and they're called secondary compounds. And these compounds a lot of the time occur in all plants, but not necessarily. So in other words, these secondary compounds are called secondary because they're not necessary for the absolute basic metabolism of all plants, whereas those other chemicals are. And not only are they important, are, are those other chemicals important in plants, they're important in all living organisms. Okay. So these are secondary compounds, and if you remember, we started our discussion of secondary compounds by focusing on alkaloids. Alkaloids are very, very important. They have pharma pharmacological or medical effects on human beings, mainly because they affect our central nervous system. Okay, so they have some sort of physiological or psychological effect on, on humans. Now, if you remember, most of these things are... Um, are herbivore deterrents. Okay? In fact, most of the chemical compounds that we're going to talk about today are herbivore de deterrents in some way. In other words, plants are producing and synthesizing these compounds to keep things from consuming them. And a lot of the time it's effective, but sometimes it's not, um, such as these different alkaloids here that are very, very common drugs of abuse in humans again, originally synthesized to keep us away from them. Okay, so we talked about these briefly, so I won't spend any more time talking about these alkaloids, and plus, we're going to talk about alkaloids a lot throughout the rest of the semester. The perhaps largest class of secondary compounds in plants are terpenoids. There are about 22,000 different types of terpenoids described in plants. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is isoprene. Now isoprene, this is sort of the chemical formula for isoprene. Isoprene in and of itself is a type of terpenoid and it's a gas. Okay? And this gas is emitted by plants, particularly during the summer, so much so that it creates a haze in the mountains. So if you've ever heard of the Smoky Mountains, the reason why they're smoky is because plants are emitting these terpenoids into the air, they're a gas, into the air during the summertime, making the, the mountains seem hazy. Now, the reason why the plants are doing this is actually not, hasn't been pinned down very well. But the current theory is, is that they're producing this gas because they think that, the, that it may be aiding the plant in coping with very, very high temperatures and that it actually may be helping to protect the plants and the leaves and the photosynthetic parts of the plant from damage by ultraviolet radiation. Now there are different types of terpenoids. Um, there are very short terpenoids. We would call that something like a monoterpenoid. In other words, it con consists of only one terpenoid unit. Or something could be a sesquiterpenoid, which means it consists of three terpenoid units, 
Um, it can be a diterpenoid, which means it consists of um, two terpenoid units. And so there are these, these different um, sized terpenoids. And they are synthesized in different parts of the plant and they have a different form than the gas um, isoprene. So for example, an example of um, a sesquiterpenoid are essential oils. So plants like basil, mint, oregano, parsley, cilantro, all of these herbs, if you take them and you crush them up and you rub them between your fingers, they feel oily. And that's because they are producing these terpenoids in the form of an oil in their leaves. And these oils are functioning to deter herbivores. If you actually eat a basil leaf or you eat a mint leaf, the first thing you taste is bitter. And most organisms stay away from things that are bitter. And so the plants are producing these essential oils, which we love to use for cooking, but which most organisms find to be pretty repulsive. Another type of terpenoid, a diterpenoid in this case, an example of that would be taxol. And if you remember, uh, Mark Plotkin talked about taxol. And what he, he said was, if you remember, was that taxol has um, anti-cancer properties. In other words, it's been shown to shrink ovarian and breast cancers. And it's harvested from the bark of the tax, uh, excuse me, of the Pacific U. So that's a type of terpenoid, which you can see here. Well, you can't see the terpenoid, but you see the plant that produces the terpenoid. And then there are other terpenoids that are called polyterpenoids, and these consist of many, many, many different individual terpenoid units. Um, an example of this is rubber. So rubber is a polyterpenoid. Um, rubber is an excellent herbivore defense because Anything that goes to bite a rubber plant or a rubber tree has its mouth parts gummed up by a latex, kind of similarly to the milkweed we talked about in class um, on uh, last Thursday. It's a really great herbivore defense, but we also have been able to use the rubber in rubber trees to make boots and other things. Now, rubber is currently synthesized. In other words, um, we don't use natural forms of rubber very much anymore, but certainly during World War II, it was a pretty daggum important plant, and they had people running all over the, um, all over the tropics looking for sources of rubber, natural sources of rubber. Another polyterpenoid is, is resin. So anytime you have a plant and it produces a clear resin, it's usually terpenoid. So pine trees, for example, have lots and lots of resins. That's a type of, of terpenoid. The chiclet tree, which you can see here, um, is produces a type of terpenoid that is um, a resin. Um, and chiclet, the chiclet tree, of course, was the first type of gum and um, led to the development of chiclets. So terpenoids can, um, can, are offensive to a lot of herbivores, but some terpenoids are actually really, really poisonous to herbivores. In other words, they don't just taste bad, they taste bad and they affect animals. An example of this um, is a type of terpenoid that's called a cyanogenic glycoside. These are produced in the leaves of passion flowers. And this story should sound familiar to you because we just talked about this in milkweeds. So the plants produce these compounds called cyanogenic glycosides, and they're called cyanogenic because they're cyanide generating chemicals. In other words, when an animal eats the leaves of a passion flower, those cyanogenic glycosides in the passion flower are converted into cyanide in that animal's body. What a great herbivore defense. It, if you eat a small amount, it makes you very, very sick. And if you eat a large amount, it'll kill you. So it's a pretty effective herbivore defense. And like the milkweed, there are there is a group of butterflies called passion flower butterflies. You can see them here that have actually um, evolved an ability to deal with those cyanogenic glycosides. And then they themselves are poisonous and therefore other predators like birds don't want to eat them. So it's a really interesting example of a terpenoid. Incidentally, the milky sap in milkweeds 
is a terpenoid. It's a rubber and it's also a toxin. Okay. There's also another famous uh, terpenoid um, is is digit or another famous terpenoid that's um, pretty famous is um, digitoxin. It's produced by a plant called digitalis. We actually end up growing this ornamentally on campus, usually over by the gym. And this plant produces a terpenoid that's called a cardiac glycoside. And as you might imagine, what happens is, is that this cardiac glycoside actually affects the function of the heart. In other words, it causes the heart to slow down and beat harder. For some people, this is good and for some people this is bad, but it definitely has an impact on the heart and you'll learn a bit more about digitalis later in the semester as well. Um, there's also another group of compounds called phenolics. This is the last group of compounds I'm going to talk about. Phenolics give plants color. They give plants color. Now, an example of um, a phenolic that gives uh, plants color are flavonoids. Flavonoids make grapes purple, they make wine, therefore wine red, and they also make flowers and different parts of the plant that are red or purplish in color. It get those those um, flavonoids that give the plant that purple or red color are a type of phenolic compound. And they can either serve a function of attracting a disperser in the case of grapes, or attracting a pollinator in the case of this passion flower. Tannins are also types of phenolics. Tannins are excellent uh, herbivore defenses and they actually decrease bacterial growth um, in plants. And so um, tannins, the reason why they're brown in color is a sort of this reddish brown color and that's a type of phenolic compound and is an extremely effective herbivore defense. Most things don't like the taste of bitterness and tannins certainly are that, very, very bitter. Another type of phenolic compound is lignin, and lignin is found in anything that has uh, a woody stem or a woody trunk. What gives the wood its strength is a type of phenolic called lignin, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Phenolics are also um, medicinal, and so if you remember reading in Plotkin about aspirin, and the willow. Here's a picture of a willow and of course the willow produces an, an acid called salicylic acid. It's a type of phenolic compound and aspirin is actually just a slightly altered derivative of this original compound salicylic acid that's used to relieve pain. The compounds are also function in pollination but they also function in um, in the ability of a plant to produce heat. So for example, some plants will produce heat, for example, this voodoo lily, it, and it emits a strange and awful smell so that um, insects will think that it's rotting meat and will come in and pollinate this plant. Okay, so what's responsible for producing the heat associated with this trickery is, um, is a phenolic compound. Skunk cabbage is the same way. The way it melts its way up through the snow is by producing these phenolic compounds that sort of literally produce heat and melt away the snow so that the plant can start growing early in the spring. Okay. The next show is going to be about plant cells.